Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are on planet Earth. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are on this fast forward planet wrapped in a pandemic still, some promising signs ahead. And right now with declining infection rates and expanding vaccination rates, but the world is still facing billions of people who have not been vaccinated and huge amount of work to be done which means a lot more screen time still. And as we've learned, I think recently, screen time can be productive in innovative ways that we hadn't thought of in the past. Uh, this has forced a lot of people online, but it's also forced a lot of thinking about what aspects of life, uh, including in classrooms, can happen better online. Uh, obviously, most of it feels like a compromise or a dreadful uh, chore even, uh, but Today, we're gonna to talk with a couple of educators out at Stanford University who I'm getting to know through their use of Oye. Oye is lowercase O-H-Y-A-Y dot C-O. It's a new platform. There are others out there, of course, that has been spreading pretty rapidly through word of mouth and digital word of mouth. Uh, I first learned about it through the Christmas party of the Journalism School's Brown Institute for Media Innovation here at Columbia University, where I'm running the Earth Institute Initiative on Communication and Sustainability. And as you can see right now, this is a very different uh, view than you would normally get here on my uh, show. And I want to unmute uh, our guests uh, so you can hear them. Uh, today, uh, we're in the classroom of Julie Zemensky, who uh, teaches uh, computer science at Stanford University. And uh, her colleague, Kayvon Fatahelian, who's also a professor uh, Computing at Stanford is here as well. Maybe you could both say hi and hope, how are things going out there? Julie, go ahead. Ah, welcome. Um, as uh, as Andy said, I'm uh, a lecturer in the computer science department at Stanford. And as he so eloquently put it, right, it's been a long uh, slog this year figuring out how to revamp. I'm a longtime classroom teacher, right, who you know has sort of muddled through figuring out how to work in the digital remote environment. And this particular quarter, I'm teaching a very hands-on lab class at the, at the intersection of computer science and electrical engineering, where we do a lot of, of lab work with tools and stuff and figuring out how to bring the same kind of, of in-class community experience, right, to our remote world has been um, really enhanced by having OEA here. And so I have some things I'll be talking about a little bit later um, about some of the ways we've been able to use the platform in ways that as, as uh, may actually change the way we teach the classes from now in the future. This isn't just a stopgap to get us through this time. We're learning a lot about things that might really make a new hybrid model emerge from the ashes. So thank you for being here. Right, yeah, so hello, my name is Kayvon Fat-Alion. I'm also uh, in computer science at Stanford. Uh, and yes, I think I, I should be upfront about I am in an advisory capacity with OEA. Um, I, I just, uh, you know, like we're always looking for ways to make the classroom more compelling and more effective. And uh, what's been, you know, if there's some silver lining of the pandemic, it has forced us to be innovative in some ways. And so uh, it's just nice as computer scientists that are used to building things, uh, having a tool that we can build largely whatever we want. Um, means that you can start experimenting with a lot of things. And I think, you know, like we're sitting here in Julie's classroom, and so I think there'll be some some good examples of, well, you can build whatever you want. You no longer say, oh, I hate Zoom. I wish Zoom just did X or just Zoom did, did X, Y, and Z. You just roll up your hands and you just make whatever you want. And I think that's the, that's the big <laughs> exciting shift for a lot of us. It's we're not really beholden to... You know, except maybe Andrew and Walt and the other folks at, at OEA building some stuff. Uh, we're not really beholden to what other people create. And, and that's, that's a really good thing. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. yeah. You sound good. Uh -huh.
<laughs> so hello, hopefully everyone out there is hearing me okay. Uh, I was broadcasting from OEA there and hopefully the audio is okay. So now I'm going to um, share my screen in a different way. And I guess I should get out of your classroom. Maybe you guys can boot me for a moment. Okay, here we go. Give me one second, everyone. And if you have any questions in the meantime, let me know. Uh, share video file. There we go. Our first education-focused training on OEA. Over the last few months, we've seen a big uptick of professors and teachers on the platform, so we're very excited to introduce Kayvon from Stanford and also Mark from Columbia University. Kayvon has been running his parallel computing class on OEA, and then Mark has been experimenting with data visualization on the platform. We're going to kick off today with a demo from Kayvon of the lecture hall experience. And you can click on the slots below with the little arm raising pictures to join us on screen. Thanks, Aletta. Um, so hey, hey, everybody that's that's out there. For those that don't know me, my name is Kayvon. I'm a faculty member in computer graphics at Stanford. I really enjoy teaching. And so when I met the OEA folks way back in the summer of 2020, <laughs> We ran a fun little party at SIGGRAPH on it, and then I was like, let's give it a shot to see if we can do the whole class in this. So what, what I've been asked to do is just talk about how I run my classroom experience here. Obviously, everybody's needs will be very different, but the thing to keep in mind is that what, what I'll show here is not something that OEA mandates. This is the space that I've created for my own needs in my own classroom. I started teaching in OEA in a fairly conventional setting. I had 150 students in a large lecture hall class, and I was pretty worried about keeping the energy up. So this quarter, I'm teaching from lecture slides that look a little bit like this. What I've done is with 150 plus students, there's little value for me to seeing anybody on screen, just kind of staring at me. So what I might ask is for everybody that's in these slots that's appearing on screen, go ahead and click on yourself to get yourself out of there. <laughs> Normally, this is my status quo, and maybe you might have a TA sitting in those slots, but I do have 150 people off screen. If anybody ever wants to interrupt me or ask me a question, click on one of these raise your hand slots. And at that point, I'll know that you have a question. So unlike Zoom, a raise hand might put something off to the side. Here's a situation where if somebody raises their hand, they'll pop into that slot and I'll say, oh, hey, you know, somebody might have a question. And so in the course of, you know, the next five minutes, if you have a question, feel free to, to pop on up there. So I'm just running my normal lecture with slides and most of the interaction, because I can't see anybody, is actually done through standard text chat. So here's a little chat box. Off to the left, folks can upvote and, and a lot of the, the, the comments that people make. The other use is the students really, really prefer, at least in my class, to do most of their question answering not via audio, but in fact via this question box. So here's my question box. Since we try and formalize questions a little bit, keeping them out of the chat, and somebody might post a question like, I'm, I'm not so sure about that definition, what about X, Y, Z? And so now that is a question sitting there that can be upvoted by anybody in the audience. So you can click on the question to upvote it. So I'm monitoring these information sources throughout lecture. And then the other source of information that I have are these emojis that you see down at the bottom. And so these emojis are what we have established in my class as our convention. So often throughout class, I'm like, hey, is everybody getting it? And you'll see thumbs up, thumbs up. You'll see a flurry of thumbs up. If people are confused, we've kind of standardized on mind blown or thumbs down or crying. And so I get this steady stream, like our convention in class is, is 
be active on the emojis so I can get a sense of what's going on. You'll notice that some of these emojis have audio. I put it in here today just for demonstration, but I actually don't have those audio emojis turned on in, in class because that would be a little disruptive. And so it's actually been fairly surprising to me as an instructor how much feedback I get even though everybody is, is off screen or, or most of the class is off screen. And so that's, that's our basic setup. Not super different from Zoom, but just a few touches here or there that mean that I have all this information right in front of me as I'm talking. There are a few things that we've done, for example, with the single button click, you know, we can remove the slides and we can start bringing people uh, back on stage. I brought Aletta back on stage if we're going to have a more sophisticated discussion in class. We've run activities where students were actually performing, acting out concepts here on stage as well. And then the last part is that we use Zoom breakout-like functionality all the time. And, and so what I'm going to do uh, really quickly is I'm going to send all of you to breakouts. And the one thing to notice is that I have, before my lecture, decided what the breakout topic should be. So when I send you all to breakouts, I've customized the look of these breakouts with certain slides, and so the students have a customized interactive experience for the breakout activity at hand. So what I'll do just as an example is I'm going to send everybody to breakouts. You're going to be teamed up in, in groups of like three or four, I believe. You're all going to appear on screen in these breakouts. And so I just want to, to show you what that might look like. There's some buttons where you can click in the breakout room to see different slides that I want my students to talk about. And so here's just one example of that. Hello. Hey there. We've got chat. Let's see. Can we try some of these buttons? Sure. I wonder what rotation does. We're probably going to stop the breakouts in about, you know, five to 10 seconds. You know, this is how I notify the students. And so, hey, students, if you go ahead and make your way back to the lecture hall using the nav bar on the left, feel free to do so or I'll just automatically pull everybody back to the lecture hall in about 10 seconds. So feel free to navigate back or I'll pull you all back to the lecture hall. The only other thing I wanted to show everybody was how we do the space as a whole. So as you see on the, the left bar, a, a number of the rooms that we have are rooms for students at any time 24 seven to hop in and study in. And one thing is that myself and all of my TAs have offices. So I'll bring everybody to an example of, of my office really quickly. So now everybody's in my office as if this was an office hours. This is a computer graphics class. So a lot of my offices are themed in Pixar like things. And so in the office hours, there's a chat and there's also a wait queue. So students can sign up on the wait queue by clicking in that top left box. So you're signing up. If you actually uh, go by your name and click on this little bell thing, you can give me your cell phone so that if you get to the top of the list, I can text you so that you don't have to be stuck by your computer if you're 30 minutes behind everybody else in office hours. So we've set up just a few mechanisms for students to have a little bit better of an office hour experience. The last thing that I'll demonstrate is, is in office hours, I prefer my students to be talking together, everybody on screen, that kind of experience. But often when students have homework questions, it needs to be done on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So I need some mechanism for a student to say, hey, can I talk to you in private? So what I have in this space yep. is a second office here that's a private office that nobody else can see. So you all cannot see my private office in the nav bar because you're not administrators of this space. So one thing that I might do, let's say Aletta asked me, I'd really like to talk about a specific question on the homework. So then what I do as the administrator in Oye is I just literally move Aletta to my private office where we'll have a private conversation about the homework. I'll do that really quickly to demonstrate. And then when we're done with that discussion, we just both jump back into the, to the main office. And then usually I take a look at my board to see who's coming up next. And, and that's largely how we run our office hours. So we have both a social aspect and a private aspect to it. I encourage you to take a look at some of the rooms we've designed. One of the more interesting ones is what's called Class Central. And in Class Central, it allows students to create private rooms. Like it's a breakout, but it's private to themselves and they can invite their friends in. So they, they know that nobody's gonna be popping in at any time. And so I've designed that room to have some fun draggable refreshments. There's a way to do double screen share, which is actually very good for team programming. 
so two students are sharing their screen at once. But I guess that's a, about it. So maybe we just head back to the lecture hall and I'll, I'll turn it back to Weta. Yep. So now we're going to move into a demo by Mark in his space, and he's been able to integrate OEA with Miro. Some of you may have heard of Miro. It's an online virtual collaboration tool. So we're going to move into his space and he's going to give us a little spiel about that. Wow, we all made it. <laughs> so my name is Mark. I teach at Columbia. I teach two classes this semester, which is slowly killing me. And I know it makes me sound privileged to say that I only teach one class a semester, but two is killing me. I teach a uh, communications class to the PhD students in statistics, my doctorates in statistics. I'm appointed in the School of Journalism, so I'm teaching a data visualization class to the journalists. So this is our crit space. Everybody has their own instantiation, so you can zoom in and do whatever you need to do and move around, but you're not affecting anybody else. And I should say that this is about the size of class that I teach, which is a second reason why you might think I've been I'm whining, <laughs> right? Oh, wow, wow, I'm teaching two classes and wow, wow, they never get over 16 students. But anyway, I, I'm able to like fill the space with images that are big enough that everybody can be seen if they want to be seen. And I usually have things of different sizes so that if someone is giving a presentation, they can jump up to, to one of the larger windows at the top. And my adjunct and I tend to stay low <laughs> and out of the way and let students talk. So we have people coming from the New York Times. We have people coming from various podcasting groups. We have science writers. We have whatever. And so for every class, there's a different room. And the room often speaks to the expertise of the individual speaking. So class one, for example, was Amanda Cox, who's the data editor at the New York Times. And we held it in the image of the Times Center, which is an auditorium attached to the New York Times building on 8th Avenue. But again, like last night for the data visualization class, most of my students were in New York. So I had some snow scene and things sort of melded in. It feels like it's a flourish, but at the same time, I, I feel like there's something about creating a space that adds to the purposefulness of why we're meeting. I've been reading this book by Priya Parker called The Art of Gathering, and she makes a point about not just gathering as a category, like it's a class or it's a networking event or it's a tea party, but think about the actual purpose. Like, why are you there and what do you hope to get there? And that in the process, you may make something transformative or memorable or what have you. There's something about the capacity of a space like this and being able to author it in a way that responds to the interactivity that you want to have with your students, which is really quite powerful and does take us from a category of thing, a class, to a purpose for why we're here. Like for this, we are here to critique. And so we need to be able to zoom in, zoom out. There's stuff that we can do here that we can't really do in other format. I should also say that we're holding the Computation Plus Journalism Conference on the 19th of February in OEA with as much of a physical metaphor for an actual conference as I can get. So we have a lobby space, we have a ballroom for the plenary sessions, we have contributed session rooms, the OEA folks who are amazing to work with are helping me get a little timer set up so that everyone only gets 15 minutes, then they get yanked from the stage, <laughs> things like that. Um, does anyone have any questions? Mark, was it hard to integrate Miro? The hardest thing was with the educational license of Miro, you have the capacity to embed it and it'll give you a link. And the only complication is that that link is an iframe. And so you have to take it out of the iframe and just put the actual link in there and it's fine. It happens pretty quickly. I was surprised that it would work so easily and so well. The, the platform itself is really powerful. The authoring of it is fairly direct for basic things. And then and there's this whole other thing that happens when you want things like stuff that shuts down or whatever that is doable in the graphical user interface that I hadn't anticipated being doable. So there's a lot of functionality that's available here to create an experience that is unique and memorable and I think adds considerably to the educational experience. I find that my students are exhausted of being on Zoom all day, literally exhausted because I don't know if you know much about journalism classes, they can be a marathon. They'll go for six hours at a time. And there's a point at which you say enough, right? So they come to my class and they're 
just overwhelmed with being virtual and they're kind of running to their limit now after so much time in this state and to provide them with a space that is thoughtful and allows them some agency and what have you is is i think really powerful so i'm gonna shut up and let someone else talk does anyone else have questions before we move to a demo of how to construct your own lecture hall in oye i have a quick question for kayvon so this all how how rapidly did you refine your lecture process and stuff this platform hasn't been around very long and that felt really really refined and pretty um put together well uh, first of all thanks i mean in full yeah. disclosure i consult for oya one day a week so so my integration with the oya folks is quite tight but i created this well aleta created this room under construction not at the bottom and so i'm happy to create a room on the fly here if we want to try that i mean yeah, let's all go there a fair level of polish by the end of the hour so click to go into under construction at the bottom of the left hand side room navigator and I can drag you if you can't find that. To sort of make some recommendations on what we should create, because I imagine other folks' lecture experience or in-classroom workshop experience is very different from mine. And so just as a demonstration, we can brainstorm and create something together if that would be of interest. So we want a poster booth. Sure, yeah, yeah. That's actually something that I've been meaning to create for myself. Let's see here. So what, what aspects of the experience do you want? Let's just say it's like a two-person poster. I don't know, just because often people work in teams of two. So the next thing I would do is I want to create a spot here for someone else that would join me on my team to not embarrass anybody. I'll throw Mark up here as well. So now this is like the poster by Mark and I. So maybe we'll stand off to the side. I personally happen to be a rounded corner person. So I'm going to round off our corners here because this is bothering me. So how do we want the students to present their posters? So I can think of a few options. One option is that they could screen share. Let me create a screen share element. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to set its background color to 0.5 just so you can see where it is. So this is something that will be my screen share. And I'll go ahead and share just my whole desktop into that. Now, unfortunately, it's going to get a little meta. So this is the editor that I have in front of me. Now you can see the space. So I'm just manipulating the screen share element. So as we keep going with the poster, were you thinking that we should just do a screen share to share the poster or we could, I mean, normally I would have my students. To, is there a view to screen share, to view the screen share full screen? By default, the screen share doesn't go to a small window. The screen share will take mm -hmm. up the space and move everybody down. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So let me let me do that real quick. So I just, this is like your default screen share in OEA. But I decided because this one might be better to have a custom screen share element to it. Let me go find a poster somewhere. <laughs> let's, let's just do this. I'm going to open up Keynote. I'm going to open up. Uh, a slide from lecture recently. Let me just export this as images for now. Just throw this all on my desktop. So let's go ahead and I'm going to take an image now that I'm going to choose from my desktop and I'm going to make that poster an image here. So I output it all my JPEGs to here. So let's just use this image as our fictitious poster going forward. Here's my poster now for our poster session. I'll bring this back to the front so you can kind of see what I'm doing. So you can kind of see how this might work. This room is set up so that the reactions actually go over the entire screen by default. I think that's probably okay in a social setting, like a poster presentation. You might've noticed that in my lecture hall, I moved it off to the side. I think in most working scenarios, you almost always need a chat box of some sort. So I always like to create a chat box off to the side somewhere. So I'll make a chat box here. Obviously this is not laid out with particular aesthetics. Like the lecture hall was, we can always add a background image to this. So I'll, I'll choose maybe the nice background that Mark had in one of his, his things. I'll add a little bit of visual styling here for, for drop shadows to separate us from that background. And you could, you know, a room is, is slowly emerging. I'm actually really interested to do a big poster presentation, not in my class, but we have one at Stanford coming up for 200 students. So it'll be fun to do a poster presentation with 200 students 
and then design a map for that whole space where everybody can see where everybody is at any one point. That's where it gets really fun to start to start designing social experiences. But as you can see, we got to something that might be workable in about five to eight minutes. And there's a bunch of little things that we'd probably do to make this space a little bit more uh, engaging or a little bit more visually pleasing if we had more time. And I just saw your question. We don't have any other specific trainings for spaces like museums, but that's a really good idea. So I'm going to pass it on to the team. Sorry to cut in. I was just, uh, Andy and I have been talking about, um, I mean, I suppose it's in fact similar. It's helpful, Kayvon uh, and Mark, to have this basic outline. Well, I suppose I was wondering about one step further to having these kind of rooms that can be joined by people where there's not a professor or a, somebody leading people through the space, but it's something otherwise that. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and that's actually where like a lot of my interest right now is to try and make these OEA spaces self-discoverable. So my partner and I, we ran a, a new year's Eve party for 150 people. And I certainly wasn't navigating people through the party. <laughs> so we did a bunch of cool stuff where we had like top level maps. We actually laid out a floor plan of the entire OEA space. Mm -hmm. And from that floor plan view, you could see who was in every room. You could get a preview of the discussion, mouse overs of the thumbnail could even engage audio. So you could peek into the audio of the room. It's quite fun actually to, to start. I mean, it's basically a mini computer game engine. It's like a 2D computer game engine really is mm -hmm. what OEA is crossed with a video conferencing system. And we're going to be hosting, like I said, a full conference where things will be happening at certain times, but it's going to be, it's going to be a conference setting where you go and attend wherever you want and there'll be parallel sessions and then lobby areas and private rooms that you can go to if you want to just hang out with people and have separate talks. So I'm having entirely too much fun designing these things, frankly, so. Question about how do I manage breakout rooms? Can you elaborate on that a little bit? I mean, most of my breakout activities are in the context of a lecture. They're not, they're not like recitation kind of breakouts where they would be be long running ones. So, so my, my breakouts in lecture are, I have the room set up in advance of lecture. So I kind of choose the slide or choose the visual, the prompt in advance of lecture. So I make sure that that room is ready to go. I send students out in small groups for them to talk about the problem at hand. And usually I let them go for about three to five minutes. And then I kind of shout at everybody, you know, oh yeah, it gives me this ability to kind of just shout into all the rooms. I kind of say, Hey, look, we're going to kind of wrap this up in about 15 or 30 seconds. And then we resume the lecture, kind of like what we did in the, in the demo today. The other use case of, of OEA is, is not what I have in my class, because right now I'm teaching some big kind of conventional lecture classes, but more of like the, at least in a computer science or, or engineering field, like the, the recitation session. And the way that works is that there's a room for every student shows up to class. They just go into a room. There is no plenary lecture. And so they are working with their team in a room, someone screen sharing, they're, they're coding together or whatnot. And the lecturers just wander throughout the rooms and say, hey, how's it going? Or the lecturers just sit in their own room and students come there if they have, have questions. Right. I saw the question pop up in the reactions about can the screen share go into all rooms? And yes, like basically I can take any room and put it into any other room. Here's an example really quickly. You can just think about it as conceptually there are feeds there are streams there's audio and there's video and you can attach any of those streams into another room so for example if we wanted to preview the lecture hall this is an actual live preview of the lecture hall so if you sit here watch this i'm going to go to the lecture hall and you will see me i'll turn up the the audio so you'll be able to hear me so hey everybody i'm in, I'm in the lecture hall and you can probably hear me from the breakout room under construction that i created so hopefully you could you could hear me do that. So that that's just just treating another room just like any other participant in the space. Wow. Mm -hmm. This is a really good way to do side conversations. So what I'll do is in the breakout room, you'll press a button saying I want to have a side conversation with someone. I'll kick every those two people into a private breakout room, but they'll have a view into the main breakout room with audio at some lower volume. So it's an equivalent to like stepping aside in a room without losing context to what your peers are doing. So that's one of my favorite kind of design paradigms that I use a lot in my spaces, which is the ability to step aside for a second. 
Because if you go completely to another room, you kind of lose context. For those who are watching, this is a, a view on of ben, a pre-recorded session curve. on um, OEA, a tutorial on how to use OEA in the classroom. In about five minutes, we'll be joining uh, two professors, Kayvon Fatahelian, who you see here, and uh, a colleague at Stanford uh, for live questions. So the learning curve to get a room like this is almost nothing. Like you'd be able to get to a I saw the question about building a custom map. We're actually currently working on a tutorial for that specific topic. And it's a little bit more complex than setting up your room navigator, but can be a lot more fun. You can set up a campus map and have people click into buildings, et cetera. And if you're not on Discord already, I can drop the link in here. But that's where we're talking to the majority of our creators. And we also just set up a channel for educators specifically. So you can ask Kayvon questions there. Yeah. Okay. So, so I'm back. Sorry about that. So if you click here in one second, let me just link this in. Okay. Let me, let me test this just to make sure it works. Yeah. Okay. So, so if you want, like, imagine we were having a conversation here, like say an office hours or a group study session, maybe a few of you sparsely one at a time or a couple at a time. If you click here to go to the side room, you'll be taken to a side conversation without really leaving this conversation. So feel free to click on it. And you can, when you go there, go ahead and click, you'll be able to hear me. You can have your own conversation in that room, but you're still engaged with the audio and the visuals of anything that's going on in the main room. So I, I really like that paradigm a lot as a way to, to step aside. So, and if you click the, the preview, you can just come back here and you're in the main room with me. So, so mentally just think about it as key. Oh yeah. is like keynote. You do whatever you want. And instead of hooking up images and text, video feeds and audio feeds can be one form of media that just gets hooked up in the scene graph. That's how I think about it. And, and just like any other room can be a video feed, a YouTube video can be a, a video feed as well. So like if I want to watch a movie in class or a, a computer graphics class, we watch a lot of short clips and animations. I just embed a movie in, in, the, in the OEA space and we all watch it together. Would anyone want to share how they're setting up their class or any questions they have uh, as they start to dive into OEA? For me, it's all in the future. <laughs> yeah. I know that we're also working on creating a beginner mode for the tool so you can have a, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like a beginner stripped down interface. So there's not as many advanced capabilities that are overwhelming in the tool. Yeah, there definitely needs to be a getting one tenth the options mode. <laughs> yeah, <cool>. exactly. <laughs> Hi, I also wanted to ask something. Uh, so Katie and I are uh, teaching assistants for an upcoming class at MIT taught by Arvind Satyanarayan about data visualization, and we decided to use OEA this semester. My question is, how can we record the uh, lectures? And I know it's possible, but my question is like, is there a way for students to access those recordings afterward? Sure. Maybe I'll take that one real quick because that's that's part of my normal flow. So OEA has record in the in the cloud, just like anybody else. And then once the recording is done, I download the the video file, the MP4 from OEA, and then I push it back up to standard lecture delivery services by Stanford. So so my workflow is record to the cloud, download video file, and then upload it in Stanford's case back to Penopto, which is the the place the sort of the, the approved mechanism for all of our Stanford students to watch their lectures. So, and, and one of the nice things about Panopto is once I get it up in there, then I can rely on all of their services for streaming, you know, like a after the fact delivery or closed captioning and stuff like that in case there's accessibility needs. The one thing that is not just like sitting there is real time closed captioning. If you are required to have that by your institution, if it, if it needs to be there, it, I think that could get built pretty quickly, actually. So, because I think a, a number of folks have, have talked about it already. But my closed captioning solution is after the fact uh, right now. Of, mm -hmm. So does OEA on its own have uh, storage, like data storage, when those recordings are stored in the cloud? My understanding is that right now, no. But, but I, I would not, you don't want to use OEA to host that for the long term going forward. You should download your lectures from OEA and put them on a more permanent storage mm -hmm. or, or lecture distribution mechanism. 
because the students do not have access to download that MP4 file themselves. From oh, the I see. Yeah. Right. So as the administrator, as the lecturer, just download Almost it time. and push it to wherever you would normally Couple minutes. your Zoom lecture videos or stuff okay. like that. Thank you. I think it's also worth noting that Tavon has worked with us to build features that didn't already exist in OEA that worked for his lecture. So we are very open to working oh, with yeah. you and evolving your class as you go on and as you need more things. We can just literally build it. We have an amazing engineering team. Yeah. Any other questions? It's great. Good. I think we can move into the portion okay. where we can just explore around and click on the room navigator to the left and click into different rooms. And all of these rooms are available in our workspace gallery. So I'll send that out after uh, the event and you guys. So we are uh, wrapped here with this tutorial part. Um, thriving online now, we're going to transition to meeting two of the professors who are using OEA in classrooms out at Stanford University. Um, so give us a second here while I transition from the uh, this part to the next part, and hopefully you have some questions. Uh, I certainly do. It's a, I think we're sort of in an exciting mode uh, where we are right now. So hold on, let me close that out. And we're going to move over to a live classroom. in one second. Great. So uh, Kayvon and Julie, can you hear me okay? Yep, yes I can. Sound good to me. Good, and hopefully there's no echoes out there for folks, uh, because I'm still audio broadcasting in two different directions. I think it worked out earlier, according to people I was were listening to the show. So I gave the, I showed the tutorial earlier. I think people got a little bit of a basic idea of what's different here, but I thought it might be fun. Julie, this is your space, right? We're, we're in it your. Is. So yeah. could you talk a little bit? Just give a thumbnail sketch of your background and then how you've been using OEA. So so what you know. Sure, sure. Thank you. Um, so uh, I have been teaching in Zoom for a year now, right, in the same way that everybody has, just using the, the basic tools that are allowed to you, right, and teaching pretty large introductory uh, programming courses, right, and um, when I, uh, this quarter at Stanford, I'm teaching a small hands-on lab class uh, in computer systems that sits at kind of the intersection of hardware and software, and um, a primary component of that class is this hands-on lab, right? We meet together in a room and we have tools and, and snacks and conversation and that, that really was the heart of that class is in the lab. And so trying to figure out a way to bring that same experience to the virtual world was a real challenge for us. So over December, right, uh, Kayvon was the one who um, uh, set up our holiday party for our department, which just blew me away with the, the beauty of the space, right? And the, and the, uh, sort of emotional sense of being in a, a shared space with people and connecting in a way that we haven't been able to do for months, right, um, was just super inspiring to me. So I uh, glommed on to Kayvon to get an introduction to the OEA team so I could start trying to build out something here. And so that became my goal over, over January was to whip up a space that would give us some of the feel of our in-class experience, but in the virtual world. So the sort of primary thing for us was really figuring out how to do labs and then as a secondary sort of component was also how to build community, how to build a space that students would come to and hang out and talk to each other and share and enjoy that would allow them to connect. Because right now they're kind of working mostly one-on-one -on -one in their dorm rooms or you know uh, childhood bedrooms, right? And really are longing for the kind of connection that comes from being in a vibrant, you know, thriving community. Um, so we we did that. So uh, the, I thought, if you don't mind, I'd like to show you if you know you want to yeah. see a room here. I, I mean, the lab room I think is maybe where I spent the most time. So there's a if you look on the left, like so. Andy, are, are are they seeing your room navigator? I can't quite tell what they're seeing. So. They're seeing your. They're seeing what is what a student would see in your class. What a student would see. Yeah. Right. So so let me take you to um. So so if if I go something, can you just follow? So I have him follow me. What should I do, Kayvon? Help me out. You can do just he can you can have him follow you, or uh, or you can just tell us what room we shall go to, and we'll just all okay. walk over there with you. Okay. So why don't we all let's let's go to lab mission control, and we'll we'll start there. 
Honey, I'm sorry, but they can't they can't get back to you in 10 minutes. Hey, welcome. Welcome to Mission Control, right? <laughs> so uh, this is the kind of master oh, space that I'm not sure that they're seeing that unfortunately. Yeah, I, 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 visit at three o'clock. That'll be fine. Let me just um share okay. screen in a different way. Oh, there it is. There okay. it is. There it is. Yep. We're good. We're good? Yep. Okay. So so hopefully what you are seeing now, right, is is uh Kayvon, Andy and I down in the bottom, and then there's a set of uh of numbered, you know, sort of purplish blue squares on the left and the help queue and things like that. And this is the is the 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 kind of staff room when we're in lab. So my class has 40 people. We want them working in kind of these small three to four person groups. So what we built was 10, what it looked like kind of permanent breakout rooms in terms of a Zoom like mindset, right? Where the students work in that room, we put in screen sharing and whiteboard components in there so they can actually sketch and draw and talk, right? They have a chat window and things like that. And then the, the we did a couple of- Julie, you, on, you, yeah. we should all go first to maybe one of those rooms. Yeah, let's just go to one there. of those rooms. So let's yeah. go, let's yeah. all go to where Matt Bosca is in room zero. So if you just click on the zero, Andy, you'll come with us. Okay. The big zero. Um, the big zero. And we have Andy, okay. Yeah, we have him coming. All right, so we got Andy and Kayvon, and then that's my, my uh, pseudo student, which is my husband's account, right? With his, the roses that he sent me for Valentine's Day. They're making an appearance here. And Julie, um, I'm going to take that second account out of the space because you're echoing because of that. Okay. Okay. Gone. Thank you. So here we are. We've got, you know, like we've got a shared whiteboard where I can draw and you can draw. We can all see and sort of work on that. We can screen share if we have something we need to talk about there. Um, which, by the way, in here. which yeah. wh which whiteboard uh, system do you use? Uh, this is using Aw Awboard Aw App dot com, okay. um, which we found to be work really well for what we needed here. So uh, it's, it's super easy to integrate into OEA. One of the neat things is just realizing that there's a lot of great web tools out there, and and the ability to kind of iframe, if you know what that that notion is about how we can plug things into here and sort of like pick and choose from the best of the tools on the web and just bring them into the OEA space and have them appear very integrated, but still really not having to reinvent those wheels, right? So if there's tools out there that you know you want to use, you can pretty easily integrate them into the OEA space, right? Um, which is pretty pretty good thing to have in your pocket. Um, things like this, we have like a, they're in the lower right corner, there's a little pinout. If you want to click on that, Andy, it'll pop up a, a sort of full screen form. This is the, uh, so if we ever have sort of things we would have distributed in lab, here's a handout or a poster or something we can have oh, kind of in our space so that they can easily grab onto it and, hmm. and uh, Take a look at that. So it's kind of like the same sort of things we would distribute in lab or have available in the space we can put into the breakout room. And then this this little board that's happening over here on the left, right? There's three lower buttons, right? This check in, help, and clear. And so what these are doing, I'm gonna I'm gonna click them for you, and you'll see the kind of changing of the colors. That's a way to signal back to the mission control. So if we're here, you know, the students are working, they're talking, they're getting through stuff, but they get to a place where they need some help. They want to check in with us. They want to uh, raise a question. They're stuck on something, right? And so the, the the signaling of them hitting this is it's setting a flag in this room, but that's also actually being uh, passed back to the the master control room. And so the staff can kind of we sort of hang out in the master control room, and then we just pop into the rooms to say see what's going on, uh, hear what's hit you there, and when they call us with these flags, right, this red and green. And that's done with some, some really simple technology of just there's a button there. Upon, you know, you hit this button, there's a, an action that follows through that says, in this case, change the color of this particular piece of the inter, you know, interface from red to, to green or to uh, transparent. So, um, and so while we're Very here, cool. we can chat. And so it's, all like, it's a nice place for us to work, but then we're also able to kind of participate in this larger uh, room of, of all these lab tables in the way we might even in our physical room. You want to go back to mission control and see what that looks like over there? Yeah. Sure. And, and you can drag people too, right? So if, if I can drag people. Yeah. You want to just, we'll, we'll just have you, uh, you know, be our puppet for a, a little Teleport. bit if you don't mind. Okay. That's fine. All right. So I, I brought you back to here. And then when we're here in, in this room, right, what we're seeing is the, the flags that are being raised, that, that red and green flag that can be raised on, Matt, uh, on room zero or one is actually telling us here, oh, here's somebody that, that actually puts their name and the time in this help queue as well. So I can see the kind of, that's a, anytime somebody raises a flag, right, it gets, it uh, adds them to what's called the waiting list here. And then there's even actually this, this kind of neat little thing up in the upper right here, um, which is using a, an element called a room preview. And then there's a switchable sort of control at the top. So I actually have 10 rooms, right? And so I can 
click on a different number, and for example, if I go to preview room zero, it actually gives me a little window into that room without necessarily going there. So and, I can, and Julie, I'm going to go there now as if I'm a yeah. student, so maybe yeah. then everybody can see. So this is room zero. You'd like me to so be a student in room zero. Yeah. <laughs> so there, there goes Kayvon into room zero. So we see Kayvon here, right? We can wave to Kayvon. We can see Kayvon, right? If Kayvon starts drawing on the whiteboard, right, we will see what he's drawing on the whiteboard, right? Um, and so there's even a way I can pump a little bit of the audio of that room into here, or I can talk to that room, but just kind of gives us a way of like, in, in a room, the way I would circulate is I would generally be having my ear to the ground a little bit, seeing what people were doing. Um, if I see somebody who's stuck or, you know, questioning something, right, I can actually, you know, kind of kind of run my eyes past the rooms one by one without having the kind of awkward, I'm going into a room, I'm coming out of a room, you know, sort of stuff that I think is a little bit uh, awkward about the Zoom world, right, has been the the transitioning between rooms has often been a little bit brutal. Um, and so this gives me a new way to, to work on those things, so. And one, um, one, one thing that came up in that tutorial with, that I participated in recently was, uh, yeah. the word was, I, I think it was Mark Hansen was saying, it gives students uh, some agency too. You know, there's flexibility and plasticity in this space that uh, is harder oh, to find yeah. otherwise. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that the uh, you know the word I would use is maybe uh, coming from a computer science background is just hackability, right? Mm -hmm. That that it's it's incredibly configurable, and so uh, you're not stuck with like you've got the Hollywood Square style layout and that's it, right? You know, like um, you can decide what's the 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 kind of aesthetic you're going for in the space. I'm, that, that's not been my thing. I'm not a great designer, so I'm I'm glad to partner with other people who have much better skills in that area than I do. But the part I really love is is making this interactivity, making these elements interact with each other, giving affordances that allow the students to, to you know, uh, do the kind of things that, that we would be able to do in person, but make it um, available to them. Like one of the things we're really looking forward to is at the, at the end of this quarter, we'll do a, a project fair. And my plan for that is actually to give each of the students their own room to design so that they get to lay it out. So rather than me deciding what they're gonna have where, where their screen share and where their participant heads are gonna be, they get to go in and do it for themselves. Make And, and the space will be theirs to work on while they're on the project as well as when they're presenting. So it kind of gives them like, it's like it's like your own cubby, your own corner of a of a, a carol in the library, right? Where you can deck it out um, the way that, that makes your space work and be productive for you. And then it's a place you can invite people in to say, come see what our project's doing, right? Come to our carol, come to our, our room, and I, I think that's a uh, um, a really neat quality is that the the space is both uh, it just accommodates a, a wide use of cases that you couldn't even have dreamed of when you started. It's just sort of an infinite uh, playground for experimenting with these things. And, and Kayvon, you mentioned um, um, uh, posters. You know, like when I think back to the AGU meetings, the American Geophysical Union meeting, the Great Hallway, there are thousands of young scientists with their posters and everyone wandering by. And I've seen some of the setups that have been done with OEA for like there was an event, a film festival last year in Netherlands, where you could, I just immediately saw each one of those little windows being a portal to a poster. So each student can, instead of a PowerPoint or like literally a paper poster at a meeting, yeah. can build a space that's conveying that. Is that is that part of what excites you too? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the part that excites me is is creating spaces that bring people together in a synchronous fashion because because that's the the thing that you know like I, I can make a web page right now that allows people to go visit you know fifty yeah. posters, but um, I can't get everybody there synchronously. I I can't foster discussions, and I can't have like the serendipitous somebody coming by listening as the fly on the wall and then and then figuring out that they want to join the conversation so so that's a lot of the stuff that i think as as a new slate of conferences sort of comes online this spring that i think you're going to see a lot more of as as like a poster presentation it's like right in the wheelhouse or something like this and, that's so interesting uh, yeah for sure and is there any what else is out there you know uh, this is the first one because again, because of a Christmas party, it was the Brown Institute's Christmas party that pulled me in. And now my, all of our virtual offices for my initiative are here on OEA. And, um, but what else is out there? I, there are other kinds of platforms, obviously they're getting a lot of attention, but I, I don't know what, whether there's some particular quality here that feels resonant for both of you. I mean, for me, it's, it really is the, it's the configurability. So I, I looked at a bunch of the other ones, like, you know, like looking at Nooks or Gather Town or Gatherly, like I, you know, I, I was advising our tree hacks, which is a, a 
you know, enormous 1500 person hackathon weekend that we had just a week ago. And I went through them with them when they evaluated a lot of different options, right? And there's a lot of neat things that are happening out there, but I think what distinguished OYA from the other things we looked at was just the infinite configurability that it, it that the back ends are, um, both supports, I think, a use case where you're, you're a, a pretty beginner user who doesn't want to mess with a lot of stuff and you just want beautiful things that are being published in the gallery. There's a great ecosystem of people sharing their creations that you can kind of leverage and use and, and adopt. And there's also, though, you can run with it yourself, right? Just take somebody's idea and riff on it or... And you know, if you can imagine it, you can build it. And so partly this room, for example, like the first time I built it, right, I I, I was a little too heavy on the room preview. I was trying to preview all 10 rooms at once, right? And so I, I got back to the OEA team and said, oh, you know what, this room is a little heavy. And they looked at my room and they said, hey, hey, you know what? And then they put in a feature that made my room work, right? And so even though I, I was kind of pushing the tool beyond where it was maybe had they had yet envisioned it to go, the responsiveness of them to, to make the tool work the way I wanted it to was was really impressive to me. So that that made a huge difference in terms of tree hacks where we wanted, we, we, we had to invent the space out of nothingness and, and we weren't always sure where we were going until we got there. Um, and they were great partners in helping us achieve the things we wanted to achieve, which was um, really yeah. um, a great experience for us. Are there any other rooms here you wanna show, show folks? Just like a little poke out? Uh, I think many of the other ones I, you know, I stole from Kayvon. So if anybody should show them, Kayvon should. Kayvon made the yeah. awesome fire room with the, the oh, right. super awesome, yeah. you know, the the shading and his lecture room. I totally took his affordance of the lecture room. So the things he talked about with the emojis and the audience row, I think has been really effective for us. Um, I mean, I, I would say the, the one thing that's been a little surprising to us and, and really we're grateful for is just having spaces that are comfortable to hang out in has caused yeah. our students to just come here night and day. Yeah. So we have a we run the Slack integration on a doorbell, it's called. So we can actually mm. see they're kind of coming and going and we and it sort of signals to people, hey, I'm in the space. And it turns out that causes other people to come to this space. And so our students just come here and work at night, even even when they don't have necessarily questions or a plan to work as yeah. a group, they're just enjoying the fact that they're not, you know, having to to slog alone. Yeah, that you that 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 quality, I've heard this over and over again, the lack of it and how this might work that way. Um there's a young PhD candidate, a new one at Columbia at the Earth Institute, who's you know, obviously she lives in California. She's out there. And she said she's craving just that, a hangout space. And then there's a colleague at the National Center for Disaster Preparedness here. They On Mondays, like right around now, they do a work slam where normally they keep a Zoom thing open, just literally like poking your head above the, yeah. the, the barriers. But having that connectivity gives them a sense of, you know, sort of organic sense of being together when they need it. And they were, I showed them around my, our, our offices and they got pretty excited about that. So that, that feels like an important power uh, potential yeah. of it. Um, Absolutely. What, what are the gaps or like, you know, what, what I'm, other than being able to pass someone a coffee cup, <laughs> you know, what, what still feels like it's possible on a screen that hasn't been achieved yet? Like what would be the next steps? It's a good question. Um, I, I think the uh, the uh, Julie and I were talking about this earlier. Is is there's you know the goal here is not to replace physical interaction. <laughs> like like that would be be silly. Um, but it would also be very naive or maybe a little bit bit. That, uh, stubborn to say that there are not interactions, there are many interactions in a virtual space that are better <laughs> than they would okay. be in a normal classroom um, yeah. uh, in terms of the ability to, to overlook everything that's going on in the space and immediately bounce back and forth between people. The ability for people to interact in front of everybody else anonymously <laughs> or without their camera on is very, right. very important to a lot of right. folks, in particular people that are shy folks. Right. The ability for me to get emoji feedback in lecture is significantly better in most cases than eye contact when lecturing because there's just this rich grammar of emojis that students are extremely adept at providing. Those are all things that are unequivocally actually much more engaging and much more information rich when you're interacting with students. It will be very interesting when we do get all back in the classroom that I don't think I'm gonna be inclined to throw away some of these advantages. But at the same time, in no way, shape or form would I ever claim that a virtual interaction is a substitute for, for talking to someone in person. 
so I think it's going to be this hybrid thing that it seems to be like a really big challenge. Uh, it's really easy to be in one paradigm or the other. Right. Um, but it's pretty clear that, that each side of the fence is better in some very clear ways. Right. I think for universities in terms of the future also, given that this, you can have a synchronous experience, at least for relevant time zones, for you know hundreds of thousands of students could conceivably. Yeah. That, mm -hmm. that has some draw to it. You know, the Earth Institute, all the issues we talk about, the climate school coming at Columbia University, they're all fundamentally global. So having that wide yeah. casting capacity, but still some sense of interactivity feels really cool. I, I, I think that we, we conflate synchronous and social and interactive with in-person. <laughs> Those are two different dimensions. Yeah. We, we need in-person. <laughs> Yeah. And I'm also a very strong believer that we need synchronous and, and highly collaborative and social. And, and, and those are two different axes of how to design a classroom. You just so reminded you need, me. You need both of them. A really important early complaint last year in the pandemic was the use of the word social distancing. Yeah, because it should have been physical distancing. What you want is social connectivity and physical <laughs> yeah, exactly. distancing. Oh, yeah. Excellent. Yeah. And, and a friend of mine on actually on the very first webcast I did last year, March 12th, he, he made this point strongly. And I thought, God, what a mistake that was in terms of yeah. public communication. There was a question that came in from Facebook. Kay Johnson asks, um, she says here, can you show how a, can you show how a lab demonstration might work? Is that something you can show? Is one of these classrooms set up as sort of lab ish or? You could talk about it too. I think I'm not sure what the what the like the lab demonstration. I'm not sure what that that means. Can we get a little more? Um, well, let's see if she. Uh, I guess uh, let's say a virtual frog dissection. <laughs> I mean. I'm oh just... <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so see, yeah, my lab is a little bit more. Uh, yeah, we're, we're electronics, right? So largely, right. what we're doing there is we're screen sharing, right? So you know, so yeah. in this case, my my home setup is I have a pretty cheap document camera, right? That. Um, you know, has a nice configurable arm. And I use mm. that to like, oh, I'm going to show you what my breadboard has got right now and, and sort of do stuff. So we do a certain amount of that. And um, for the students to be able to do that, we really wish they had webcams. We don't necessarily, they don't necessarily have a document right. camera. Um, but there's some pretty neat things you can do with like uh, just a, a small piece of plastic with a mirror and a, and a, a camera on your phone, right? Hmm. Uh, so you can actually sort of mock up, you know, a pretty cheap affordance where you can get sort of a facing down or, you know, hang your camera off something with a clamp or something. So um, as a way of, of being able to yeah. see what the students are seeing with their hands. Um, right, right, right. I'd, actually, that's a, oh, wait, she asked, um, if she's asking, I'm thinking about chemistry or physics. Yeah, yeah. So so maybe, maybe the word lab here is, is I'm, I'm, I'm getting into territory where I'm starting to, you know, promise where I can't deliver, which is I haven't yet tried to do a, a chemistry or, you know, a, a physics lab in that sort where there probably is more more thinking about how to how to show the students what you're doing and kind of have them observe. We're we're wiring stuff, so it's mostly just looking at schematics, looking at breadboards, and right. Um, it's a little bit easier to do with just a simple camera. Kayvon, you you were talking about for you the value being mostly the uh, synchronous social connectivity. I do still see some. Maybe it's just the novelty factor. I think it's more than that. Uh, if you want to build an experiential learning. Like, you know, I, I remember in LA, I took a, when I was living there, I took one of those online driving driver's ed classes. Basically, it's a sequence of learning and, and a challenge. And then you go to the next challenge, you go to the next, and you actually hopefully learn something by the time you're done. And I could see a series of rooms feeling more effective than oh uh, yeah, absolutely. a room with a door. Here's a room with a challenge and a door and a room and a challenge and a door. And, absolutely. and, and like, like in the game world. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that, there, there's, you know, what what does Oye uniquely do, right? Like, Oye allows folks like Julie and myself to rapidly build video conferencing applications, you know, like persistent video conferencing applications. We can write code, we can use the editor, we can build whatever we want. Uh, what you're suggesting with, wow, it would be great to have interactive games to, uh, you know, to teach, you know, I grew up on Math Blaster, and I, I imagine grew, like that, that stuff's been around for a long time. And so, right. you know, in some ways, like the the real new thing here is, yeah, sure, I, I can build some games in this platform very quickly. But those the platform is distinguished from other simple mobile app game development platforms and stuff like that in in the synchronous video conferencing with others aspect. Yeah. So. 
there are plenty of frameworks out there for me to go build a game. Yeah. And that said, like, okay, it's actually surprisingly powerful. It's <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so making it a lot easier to build a game in 2D. But, uh, yeah. uh, but the really unique thing here is that two people or many people can be in that experience at the same time and be working together to solve a problem or something. And I'm not sure if we've mentioned it's up to about 400 people per, per room, theoretically, right? It's I've like, heard 500 because I'm, I'm about oh, to push yeah. that boundary with a project I've got coming up. So wow. I've, been, I've been very eager to know what that number is. And there's a way to link workspaces. So you can actually, yeah. uh, for all intents and purposes, right, you can, you're not limited by that number um, other than it's sort of behind the scenes, there's a little bit of partitioning you need to keep your audiences, but you can link mm -hmm. them to where they effectively form one seamless workspace. Great. Well, we're we're at the turn of the hour and we all have busy days. And I'm just really glad that we were able to build a little bit on that tutorial and uh, give teachers, uh, educators, and maybe students some sense of potential here. Uh, OEA.co, O-H-Y-A-Y.co. Still, you can, anyone can pretty much go there and get a um, beta account and start exploring. I, I'm a big fan for various reasons. And it's been great to have uh, two computing professors from Stanford give a deeper dive into uh this platform if, if people have questions once this is archived uh they can get in touch with me easily through the scrolling bar at the bottom there's uh, feedback and question information thanks so much Kayvon and julie for being here today and spilling some of your learning in in, in teaching into the wider universe thanks thank Andy. you and uh thank you. we'll have to come back sometime Mar mark hansen couldn't come today others at columbia are starting to poke at this so uh much, much to go, uh, go at going ahead. Thanks again. Thank you.